All right, so we are at uh, 2 o'clock Eastern and 1 o'clock Central, so we'll get started here. Uh, thanks, everyone, again, for being here today. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to come out and spend some time with us uh, as part of our Scale Day event. So this is our third installment for our Scale Days uh, today, uh, and we're very excited about that. So I will go through some quick housekeeping slides, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Vafai. So with that being being said, um, so that's me. I'm Patrick Anderson. I'm an arborologist here with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. I'm actually just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, with us here today also is Allison Harrell, also an arborologist with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancement. She's out in Portland, Oregon, uh, and Allison will be helping us uh, man the chat and question and answers and just some technology things on our back end. Um, so a couple housekeeping things. One is if you have a question, please put it in that question and answer button. So um, we have this question and answer button here. We have this chat. You can use the chat to chat if you'd like, uh, but we're going to answer questions out of the Q&A. It makes it a lot easier uh, for us to organize those and get those answered for you. Um, this webinar will be recorded and the link will be sent out afterwards. So if you miss something, if you want to review something, it'll be available to you. Uh, and then finally, this webinar is worth one ISA CEU. So with that, if you did not put in your ISA CEU number when you registered, put that into the Q&A now. Also, so again, uh, if you put it in the chat, we lose things in the chat, uh, the way it kind of transfers over on the back end. So if you put that in the Q&A, we'll make sure to capture that for you and get you your ISA CU. Uh, there's also this raise hand function. We're not going to let people kind of like talk other than our presenter. Uh, so if you have a question, if you have a question uh, that you want to answer, please, again, put that in the, um, the Q&A uh, box right there. Um, and with that, I want to um, introduce Dr. Uh, Vafai, with the, uh, who is an Extension Program Specialist with Texas A&M. Um, a little bit more here is that um, Dr. Vafai uh, works serving greenhouse and the nursery industry with Texas uh, A&M AgriLife Extension. His work focuses on investigating IPM management strategies for common and invasive insect pests, such as aphids, two-spotted spider mites, thrips, white flies, mealybugs, and crepe myrtle bark scale. Um, his work has paid special attention to the population dynamics and management of crepe myrtle bark scale and biological control of white flies and greenhouses using predators and parasitic wasps. So a lot of great stuff there, and we are very excited uh, to have him here with us today. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to turn it over. Um, hopefully we can, there, excellent. And then, uh, so we see your desktop right now. There's your presentation. There we go, right. you see that? And I'm, got it perfect. I'm going to fade into the background and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being perfect. here and thanks for all of our uh, yeah, thank you so much, Patrick and Allison, for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be able to present on scale insects that are uh, relatively common here in Texas. There's two main ones that we're really going to focus on here today. Uh, and then I'm going to also provide a almost like a field guide to some of the other very common scale insects of Texas. So we're going to do an in-depth view of two species uh, and then field guide view. So that hopefully helps you with general identification and general management of some of the other common scale we see in Texas. Now, uh, throughout this presentation, to uh, increase engagement, uh, I have, you'll see this little QR code right here. I'm going to ask you to pull out your phone and go into your camera app, or if you have a QR code reader, uh, most modern phones, if you, if you just point your camera to it, uh, will take you to this link here at the bottom, pollev.com forward slash airfund v202. And I'm going to just check on my phone here real quick to make sure it's actually working. It appears to be working. So there'll be some uh, questions that kind of come up through the uh, presentation that you can help um, contribute to. I also want to say that this presentation I've made available in PDF form on my website, which is sixleggedaggy.com. So you do not need to uh, quickly jot down everything. You're welcome to take screenshots if you like, or, or, or um, you know, take pictures of stuff. But like I said, I'll have the PDF of this presentation is available on my website in the very end. I'll provide a QR code to get directly to there as well. So starting off, this is kind of like a little warm up exercise. All right. In general, what distinguishes scale insects from mealybugs? If you are asked uh, in the poll everywhere to register for credit, you can just hit skip for now. All right. Don't worry about that there. 
So uh, in general, what distinguishes scale insects from mealybugs? Option A, the scales do not produce wax. Option B, scale females die upon laying eggs. Sorry for the typo. Next one, scale insects do not develop wings. And lastly, scales do not produce honeydew. So go ahead and uh, give that one an answer. So both scale and mealybugs are, are relatively common in the landscape. Um, both of them seem to be able to appear uh, to, to, to produce some kind of wax. Maybe, I don't know. We'll find out here in just a moment. Maybe I'll give you guys a few more seconds. All right. So we got the vast majority saying scale insects do not develop wings. Uh, the correct answer is actually scale females die upon laying eggs. Now, this is in general. Uh, what distinguishes uh, scale insects from mealybugs is that mealybug females can lay essentially several clutches of eggs. So they can lay eggs, uh, but the female doesn't necessarily die in there. Whereas within scale insects, uh, the female actually produces her egg sac. She lays all the eggs in there and dies in there. So she can only lay one clutch of eggs, and that is it. <clears throat> Now scales, there are some scale insects that do produce uh, wax. And there are even some scales that are called wax scales or even the soft scales look a lot like mealybugs. Um, scale insects do not develop wings is also not quite true because actually what we're gonna see here is that scales have a strong sexual dimorphism. So that means the males and females look very different. The females do not develop wings, but the males do. And we'll see an example of what uh, the winged males look like in crate myrtle bark scale. The same goes for mealybugs as well. The males frequently have wings. And then scales do not produce honeydew. Um, there are some exceptions, but that's not what distinguishes scale from mealybugs. So there are some scales that do not produce honeydew, uh, but um, some scale also do produce honeydew. And mealybugs, for the most part, usually do produce honeydew as well. All right, very good. So what are scale insects? They are hemipterans. They are sucking insect pests, very similarly related to things like aphids and white flies. So we'll see here in terms of their uh, taxonomy, their relatedness, uh, you see over here, cocoidea, which is our scale insects in this group, and its sisters in terms of relatedness include aphids, uh, we have phylloxera bugs, which are similar to aphids as well, but these are kind of like our root aphids that we sometimes get, or gall-forming aphids. Um, we have white flies and jumping plant lice. They all have sucking mouth parts. They have uh, soft, soft-bodied, uh, so on and so forth. Now, when we go within, uh, sorry, cocoidea, uh, within that group, then we start to see a little bit more specific differences within scale. So if we go, for example, just to this bottom branch, you'll notice this one group, pseudo pseudococosidae. Uh, and in this case, pseudo pseudococosidae being basically fake scale. And that's mealybugs. So mealybugs are technically a type of scale. But again, what distinguishes them is that the females can, you know, don't necessarily just die in that egg sac. They can lay eggs and, you know, keep being alive, moving around and laying more eggs. And in general, a lot of scale after that first crawler stage, so again, be an exception for mealybugs after that first crawler stage, start to lose their legs and leg function and don't really move. They're, they're rather sessile. Whereas uh, mealybugs, even the adult females can still uh, move around. Um, now you'll notice here that we have several different types of scale and we're gonna talk about some of these different groups. One of the very important ones to be aware of is this armored scales. Uh, and armored scales are kind of distinct from the others because they rarely produce any honeydew, rarely or don't produce honeydew. And that's that sticky solution as a result of um, excess feeding that they will excrete the excess sap that basically they don't need. And uh, so in this case, uh, armored scale do not produce that honeydew, whereas a lot of these other scales do. And as a result, you also get sooty mold. So that sticky solution getting on that bark or leaf surface is what allows this concoction of molds to grow on there, which is then we get this sooty uh, mold kind of appearance. 
One more difference between armored scale and some of these others is that uh, the female egg sac or, or egg cover rather is, is more of a cover. So you can actually lift it off and the eggs would still be under it. Whereas these soft scales and other scales, um, they're kind of inside. So you can't actually, if you lift it off, you're removing the entire egg sac, the entire insect. These insects, again, they have sucking mouth parts. So unless they are armored scale, they're usually producing some kind of honeydew. So that's the sticky solution, which as a result can get uh, inoculated by this sooty mold. Now, sooty mold in general on its own is not considered harmful, although it's considered aesthetically unpleasing and can produce the uh, sun ray absorbing power of the leaf, right? It kind of needs those rays in order to uh, photosynthesize. And so when you're actually, you have a sooty mold on there, it prevents that, that leaf from being as effective. We also get, like I mentioned before, a strong sexual dimorphism. So we get these eggs here uh, under F that then become these crawlers when they first emerge. They become what's known as crawlers. They are the most mobile stage that finds a new place to establish. Then they either, they start to develop through nymphal stages and become either a male pupa which uh, basically starts to develop wings. So it looks very much like a very small pink fly, essentially. Or they become this gravid female, which then again forms that egg sac around her, uh, lays all of her eggs and dies within there. So that's where, again, so scale and mealybugs actually have this, this kind of similarity, at least in terms of the sexual dimorphism with mealybugs, the difference being that the, the female doesn't die within that egg sac. She will uh, produce uh, an egg sac with eggs in there, but she will continue to move on and, and continue to um, lay some more eggs. And uh, a lot of them produce a waxy coat. So we're going to talk about crepe myrtle bark scale in some detail, but this waxy coat is what makes their management particularly challenging because a lot of our contact insecticides are not gonna penetrate this waxy coat. And so we really want to target stages that are most vulnerable, such as those crawlers. When they first come out of those eggs, they uh, typically have very little waxy coating or pr protective coating. And that's kind of the time in which we wanna hit them at least with contact insecticides. All right, so, you know, we've we know that that scales you're obviously here because scales uh, are obviously a pest in the landscape right and, and uh, might prove to be somewhat problematic in terms of management but i'm going to ask what benefits do scale insects have if any so again pull out your phone let me make sure it's still working on my phone as well again if it asks you to register just hit skip i want to ask what benefits do scale insects have so they are used to produce natural cotton as A. B, they are a natural source of flavoring and processed foods. C, they are a natural source of coloring and processed foods. And lastly, D, they have no direct benefits to humans. All right. So we have this, uh, we have the majority of people that I would say have the correct answer. There's, there's more than one answer, as we're going to see here in a moment. Um, but only one is provided here, which is they're a, a natural source of coloring and processed foods in a lot of foods, uh, actually. Um, that the product that you want to look for is, is, is carmine, uh, which is in there that uh, is actually derived from cochineal scales, or if it says cochineal dye or anything like that. Uh, is, is a naturally derived dye from scale insects. And it's actually been documented. You can see here, this is from the 1700s, using a horsetail to brush off the scale into a little bowl uh, to create a red dye uh, very early in human history. It's actually even thought that the Aztecs uh, used to use cochineal scales for uh, red coloring and red dye. And because of this, um, you know, and, and here's an example, actually, if you if you ever see, especially like a, a prickly pear cactus uh, in Texas has these scales that produce this really bright red dye. And you'll see um, 
oftentimes if you've seen any criminal bar scale talks, or as we talk about it today, to know if you have an active infestation, one way is to actually you know, use your fingernail, a key, a coin or whatever to basically crush that scale. And if you get this pinkish red blood, you know that it's an active infestation. Because the thing about scale insects is that even if they're dead or, or have emerged out of those egg sacs, that waxy you know, exuvia, the waxy uh, egg case can still remain on that tree. And so you might not actually have an active infestation. Uh, and so, you know, you might end up spending money spraying insecticides on, on a bunch of just like literally wax sitting on, on that tree. So we want to determine if that thing is alive. <clears throat> and here's an example of, of one way of doing it. In this case, I think I used a rock because I knew that these scales are um, particularly potent in their staining ability. Uh, you'll actually, that red will get kind of, you know, stay on your finger for a little while. So it's a very potent dye. Um, and it's been used actually by American Indians to make crimson dye to paint missionary buildings, particularly in the San Antonio area. So there's even a history in Texas of it being used uh, in, in early as an early dye. And if you ever had the, the um, you know, pleasure of, of checking out some kind of early uh, art galleries, uh, this is from, this is Rembrandt from, uh, have you ever been to Amsterdam to the Netherlands? Uh, you know, you'll see a lot of those early paintings typically look relatively Bland-ish uh, until you know those discoveries of specific types of dyes and colors, and a lot of those reds at that time uh, were often uh, derived from cochineal scale, and so that uh, became a very effective, cost-effective manner to be able to uh, add a, an entire color to the artist's uh, palette. It's also been used uh, for biological control of weeds in this case. So uh, Opuntia uh, cacti actually considered invasive in other parts of the world, such as in Kenya, and they've actually released a uh, scale in order to help suppress those cacti. So in some instances, uh, you know, having herbivorous insects can be considered beneficial if what they're feeding on is, is an invasive plant. Uh, so they've been used in, in that manner as well. So there's two main categories, which we've already spoken about when it comes to scale insects, right? So we have the soft slash felt scale, which produce a thin waxy powdery outer layer. They cannot be separated from the rest of the body. So if you lift them up, the whole thing comes off the tree and they produce honeydew. And we have hard or armored scale, which have a hard shield-like covering. And you'll see, we're going to run into some exceptions where there are some hard armored scale that appear to have a thin waxy layer. So that's, I don't, I don't think that's the best rule for judging a hard versus soft scale. It is not attached, attached to the insect body. So if you lift off that cover, you'll actually still see the, the uh, you know, either the female or the eggs under that cover. And they do not produce honeydew, so you will not get sooty mold. And they can be kind of helpful in identifying an, uh, a particular scale in the landscape. That can be a very quick way of knowing if you're dealing with an armored scale or, or a soft scale. So this might help, um, you know, uh, me either in this presentation or in future presentations to know what are some of the common scales you encounter in the landscape. So start putting them uh, again in that little um, in, in that poll everywhere on your phone. Again, if it's asking you to register, just hit skip. All right, Lacanium scale, got obscure scale, got T scale, uh, CMBS, that's crepe myrtle bark scale. Uh, that's, that one's a little bit bigger, meaning that it's a little bit more common because we're gonna, we're gonna cover that in more detail. Got the Cycad scale, T scale again, Euonymus scale. Yeah, so I think that covers most of, so we're going to basically have a, a very good glance at most of these. And I think the ones that are a little bit bigger, we are going to get a more detailed uh, look at here. So, uh, it, you know, first first things first is uh, kind of monitoring in the field. Something that would be very helpful if, if you don't already have is certainly a hand lens, right? So a hand lens is going to help you to see, especially those immature scale in the field. Uh, and or also just see the distinguishing features of, of the scale in the field. 
Now, personally, I've stopped holding uh, or carrying a hand lens and I'll either use a head lens and that's if I'm systematically monitoring, right? If I'm spending an entire afternoon just monitoring, you can get these head lenses for 18 bucks off Amazon. If you just search headband magnifier, you'll find all different types of brands. Um, and that, that allows both your hands to be free. So you can very quickly and easily manipulate leaves, especially because a lot of these scales are usually on the undersides of leaves. You can take a nice uh, quick glance or I'll actually use a camera clip-on lens. So uh, I remember when I was first looking into these probably about you know seven or eight years ago, uh, they weren't that great. You'd get a lot of chromatic aberrations or, or distortion, right? It's like images would look all kind of blurry or kind of really fisheye and whatnot. But there are some lenses that I found that work uh, quite well. This is not a specific endorsement, but just based on my experience of working with some of the lenses, uh, this one has worked very well. So this is a Zenvo lens. And it comes with a 15 times macro and a wide angle, uh, basically a twist on. So you can actually remove that macro lens if you wanted uh, and just have that 15X macro. Now, of course, to, to make this work with your phone, you have to make sure there's no case on your phone because this needs to sit very flush uh, and perfectly centered with that lens when you go to take a photo. But you can get some very high magnification which can help not only it replaces the hand lens function, but also allows you to take a photograph or a video in the field. So you can then share that with others if you're looking for an identification. So here's an example of you know, how it's used. It's clipped onto that phone and you get some uh, pretty good magnification. Now, the one that I have been using now is a bit more of an investment. Again, not a specific endorsement, um, but it's called uh, Moment. And they make a specific case for your phone. So you need to have some of the more, more common phones uh, like Samsung, Google Pixel, or Apple phones. And they make a specific case for it whereby the lens can actually clip on. So I don't know if you can actually see me right now, but you'll see my phone actually has that uh, particular case on it. There's a little slot where uh, that lens can actually twist on. And so it, that means the lens is a lot smaller and easier to actually get on there. You don't have to take off your case in order to put the lens on. It is a bit more of a heavier investment. So with the case and the lens, you're looking at about 130 or $150 now. Um, but if you're using it a lot, I think it's, it's well worth it. That's what I've used, um, quite a bit in the field nowadays for just getting pictures of specimens or videos of specimens, uh, when it comes to identification. And it certainly helps to have a microscope handy. If you don't have a microscope for, uh, some higher magnification as needed, especially if you're looking for scale crawlers, uh, it can really help if you can take some samples in the field and look at them under a microscope. They're usually not a major, they don't need to be a major investment under a couple hundred bucks. Uh, and you should be able to get some that would, that would last a while and have uh, good enough magnification. Now, one of the common uh, monitoring tools for scale is just using double-sided sticky tape, wrapping that around a branch or a trunk or whatever it might be, and uh, removing it, say, a week later, and you're catching those crawlers, that most mobile stage. So this is an example of what we actually use to catch crepe myrtle bark scale. You can see all these little crawlers here on the double-sided sticky tape that after you know having it on the tree for a week, removing it, putting it on some grid paper, I like to put a sheet of clear plastic over that so that I don't have to worry about it sticking to other things. And then I can take a look at it under the microscope to count those scale. So like I mentioned, we're going to cover a couple scale in detail, criminal bar scale and cycad and all scale in detail because they are of particular importance uh, here in Texas, whether it be a relatively new invasive or it be a quarantine pest. And then, uh, like I said, I'm going to do kind of like a field guide view. So it's a single slide. Uh, with just like a, a general description, host plants and management for the rest of these. And I'm going to go through those, you know, somewhat quickly. It's going to be very dense information. Uh, but the main purpose is that you can go back again, I've made this PDF available and you can print that off if you like and, and use that essentially as a bit of a field guide. So you have that uh, available for your use as well. So starting off with crepe myrtle bark scale, was first seen uh, just north of Dallas around 2004, maybe even a bit earlier than that, um, and is now found virtually from West Coast to East Coast uh, USA. So it's uh, very quickly uh, spread all across uh, the US. And it's originally from Asia. Now, it was thought that, um, you know, when it was first called in at around 2004, um, 
you know, it was first thought that maybe it was the azalea bark scale because there is this similar species uh, looks very similar to the crepe myrtle bark scale, but it's on azalea specifically and was never known to occur on crepe myrtles. Uh, and so it was thought that maybe there was like a host shift. Maybe they, you know, some subpopulation had adapted to crepe myrtles and now had exploded. Uh, and so here's the azalea bark scale. And anyone familiar with high infestations of crepe myrtle bark scale, this is kind of what it looks like. And this is where, you know, then they also saw in the records, and this is a lot of the work of Dr. Mike Merchant, who's now retired out of the Dallas Center, uh, Dallas, Texas a and Agri-Life Center. Uh, you know, I'd also found the records that there were a lot of scale on crepe myrtles records in, based out of China and Japan, and Inner Mongolia. And you can see here as an example, a Beijing Botanical Garden, in November of 2013, this crepe myrtle that has very heavy city mold deposits and has some of these white spots on there as well. And so with the um, good, good work of some uh, good insect taxonomists, uh, you know, they start to compare the Zellia bark scale with this crepe myrtle bark scale uh, from China and trying to determine if what we had here on crepe myrtles was indeed a new invasive, did it actually come from China, or if it was the Azalea bark scale. And uh, in a combination of morphological features, but also some molecular tools looking at the, the DNA, they found that indeed it was an invasive. So it, it was probably introduced uh, perhaps some people bringing some um, crepe myrtle, you know, stalks and some cuttings back from China with some infested materials, putting in their landscape. Those populations grew from there and uh, subsequently just started to uh, invade and, and became widespread after that. Now, I do want to give a disclaimer. Um, so there's there's a lot of uh, news around crepe myrtle bar scale and almost like I want to say some fear mongering, how I would call it, right? So invasive species killing crepe myrtles in green country. And this is all about crepe myrtle bark scale. Uh, I have rarely in my, you know, maybe five years now of working on crepe myrtle bark scale, seen crepe myrtle bark scale be the cause of death of crepe myrtles. If it's a very new planting put in the landscape and it's highly infested and in a poor spot, then it's possible that, that it could kill the crepe myrtle. And I've seen maybe one instance of that that I can think of. But if, if, if someone is planting a highly infested crepe myrtle in a poor spot, it, it you know, probably didn't deserve to live anyway, or, or at least uh, it's not the fault of the, the crepe myrtle bark scale anyway, let's put it that way. Um, so this is not uh, often a, a tree mortality issue as much as it is a tree aesthetics issue. So any of you working in the landscape management are probably aware that you know, how much um, crepe myrtle bark scale someone will tolerate in the landscape can, can depend greatly, depending on if it's some highly cured landscape versus someone's backyard that, that maybe they don't even notice it. Uh, and so you have to kind of pick and choose kind of what is, you know, what, what, what level of crepe myrtle bark scale is considered acceptable because you really don't have to worry about it for the most part of actually causing tree mortality. Now, the concern is we've also seen it uh, start to get onto some other types of plants. Now, uh, based on the original literature, it can infest a number of other species, including beautyberry. We have seen it uh, infest beautyberry in the Texas landscape. So that's... Um, you know, another potential host. And then in lab settings where they've actually, again, just trying to test um, some of the, some of the uh, potential hosts in the literature and see if that holds true, at least based on the populations we have here in the U S uh, yes, they found established on American beauty berry, but also on pomegranate uh, also on henna, uh, hymia, winged loose strife, purple loose strife, European wan loose strife and California loose strife. You can see based on some of these plants have a very wide uh, distribution. So that can kind of help create um, a path for crepe myrtle bark skill to get around the country into a lot of other plants that would have otherwise been, uh, you know, relatively safe, let's say. But now uh, it seems as though it's possible based on the population we have that they may be able to establish on these plants in the landscape and further spread from there. Now, we have not seen them establish in the landscape on these particular pests, uh, sorry, on these particular plants. These are, again, in controlled kind of lab settings. The only one we've also seen it really established in the landscape is the uh, beauty berry. 
in terms of general life cycle, right? We can get the sooty mold again because they do cause sucking damage. But this is what the immatures look like. Right? Immature scales are much smaller, hard to see with the naked eye, and usually look like a very small pink insect. And you can see when they first come out of those eggs, these are those crawlers that are moving around looking for a place to feed. And eventually when they do settle, they're usually not moving around much after that. They usually are staying there and feeding, uh, and eventually forming that uh, white waxy coating around their body, either as a male pupa or again, as a female uh, that's going to be laying some eggs inside an egg sac. So here is again that crawler. Here is the um, tip of a of a needle. So you can see they're very small, hard to see with the naked eye. Here's a bunch of eggs inside an egg sac that's been opened up. Whoops, I just hit the wrong button. Here we go. Um, and in terms of identifying female egg sacs versus male pupae, the male pupae are smaller and more oblong, whereas the female egg sacs are quite a bit larger and puffier. Uh, so that's one way of knowing whether you're starting to, you know, you're looking at a bunch of female egg sacs with a lot of crawlers about to emerge, or if you have more male pupae, so they're going to form wings and fly off and look for a female to mate with. And here again is what that uh, little crawler looks like. Uh, with some uh, just little waxy hairs just starting to develop uh, on its back. This is actually, sorry, a second instar nymph. So you first have your, your first instar crawler, which is the most mobile stage, and then you, you start to develop uh, from there. So this is the next developmental stage after the crawler. And this is actually a gravid female. So this female is about to lay a bunch of eggs. You can see in this case, she still actually has her legs, but she's not really using them for moving around. At this point, she is staying inside that egg sac and um, if, if you open up that female, you can find anywhere between 60 to 250 eggs. So a good number of eggs uh, per female. And again, here's that uh, male, the male actually, who the winged male actually looks like. So scales, again, uh, just like mealybugs, the males can be winged. And that's how they will find a new female using pheromones. They'll find a female to, to mate with. Now, again, so the females don't have wings. So the question is often then how are scale kind of dispersing around? So especially with these soft or waxier scales, it's not that wind can play a pretty major role in dispersing these insects. Oftentimes it can also crawl under, uh, under larger uh, insects and or birds. So they can walk on the feet of birds or walk onto uh, the feet of, of larger wasps and disperse that way. And then there's obviously all so human dispersal, whether it be in uh, infested uh, plant materials moving around, um, you know, it's not too um, uncommon that there, there's a lot of uh, branches cut back uh, here every single year, and they're put in the back of a pickup truck and just driven across town. And again, a combination of that wind action, right, kind of that wind blowing over those branches, those infested plant material has a good chance of, of kind of dispersing some of that infestation. In terms of the um, current distribution, uh, again, I kind of mentioned they're from West Coast to East Coast. Officially reported through a reporting system uh, is this um, EdMaps, all right, edmaps.org forward slash CMBS, where we actually have people uh, coming in here and reporting when they actually find them. And you can help report as well. If you find criminal bark skill in a new county, a new area of Texas, uh, please do go to stopcmbs.com. And there you can select the distribution map or report a sighting, and you can contribute to this map. So we can have an idea of where it has and where it has not yet been reported. So this is what happens when you actually are reporting a sighting. You'll put the pest, uh, the host plant, which is most likely going to be crepe myrtle, observation date. It really does help to you know make sure you put your location in there and provide some images. So if you do this on your phone, you should be able to snap a photo and, and upload it right into there. And that really helps us to, to um, be able to verify whether what was reported was crepe myrtle bar skill or not. There are no other uh, areocosidae, any other of those like white, uh, fluffy scale that really occur on crepe myrtles. So when we see that on a crepe myrtle, it, it provides some pretty strong confidence that that's crepe myrtle bark scale. Now, if it's on a different host plant, that's where we might then inquire and, and try and find out if it is crepe myrtle bark scale starting to move on to some of its other potential hosts in the landscape. Now we've done uh, you know, a lot of research on criminal bar scale over the last several years. I'm gonna kind of summarize uh, some of it and, and talk 
um, about some of the recent research we've done in a little bit more detail. But one of the first things we uh, tried to investigate was whether there was any resistance, any cultivar resistance uh, in the landscape to crepe myrtle bar scale. And this was work done back in 2014. This is some of the earliest um, work we started doing on crate myrtle bark scale. And these crate myrtle trails of McKinney, that's just north of Dallas, have over 120 varieties of crate myrtles. Uh, and it had a history of infestation. So the idea was to go there and look at at least five trees of each cultivar uh, that, you know, and we didn't look at all 120, but we, we picked a, a handful and see if there's any differences in infestation or ideally see if there are any that really don't have crepe myrtle bar scale that might suggest some uh, resistance. And so we took three branches from each of those trees and we inspected them under a microscope and we counted the number of scale on those three random branches. Again, at least five trees per uh, cultivar. Now, a bit of a disclaimer here is that this is observational data. We didn't uh, put a hundred scale on every single one of these trees and see, you know, how the population changed over time. So it's very possible the starting population or the starting insect pressure was very different depending on cultivar. So the different, the, the, the important takeaway here is to see whether there's any plants that really had no scale. And, and why do I mention this kind of disclaimer? Well, so here on the x-axis are the different uh, cultivars of crepe myrtles that, that we looked at. On the y-axis is the average number of scale per 30 centimeter of branch. So you can see the higher it is, the more scale we found per 30 centimeter of branch. So based on this, we might incorrectly conclude the Tuscarora, Lipan, Pink Ruffles, and Tuskegee uh, appear to be the most susceptible to crepe myrtle bark scale. Whereas Natchez, Twilight, Sarah's favorite, uh, Biloxi and, um, and, and Powhatan, all of these over here are the least susceptible. But if you live in Tyler, Texas, where we have mostly notches in the landscape, you'll know that we have a whole lot of crepe myrtle bark scale. Those numbers are pretty high. Uh, and so this, the, this data here might have just been, again, as a result of natural pressures occurring in the landscape instead of uh, insect, uh, sorry, uh, cultivar resistance to, to different um, crepe myrtle bark scale. And so um, you know, what we found from here was that every single cultivar was susceptible. Every cultivar had some scale on it. Now, there was the question as well, you know, do they actually get on the purple leaf or the diamondback um, crepe myrtles? And we have seen, made some observations that it does. So, uh, it, so far, we have not found any that are completely resistant to crepe myrtle bar scale. The next thing we want to know was uh, population dynamics of crate myrtle bark scale, right? If we can know uh, when, when do they go into egg stage, but more importantly, when, when do those first eggs start to emerge as crawlers, we'll be able to better time our insecticide applications for optimal suppression of, of crate myrtle bark scale. And so we put double-sided sticky tape on uh, five, at least five branches per tree, uh, at least three trees per location. And we had several locations across the state, including Louisiana and Arkansas. And we did this over three years, again, to get an idea of that change in relative abundance of those scale crawlers over time. So we'd move those tapes and count those crawlers. So here are all the locations that we looked at. It was Dallas, Call Station, Huntsville, and Tyler in Texas. And we also had Shreveport and Huma that will be presented here. So on the x-axis is my month of the year. And on the y is my average number of crepe myrtle bark scale that was counted on that uh, piece of double-sided sticky tape. So in 2015, if we look at that year alone, every single one of these locations, the number of crawlers begins to increase, begins to increase towards its first peak, right? From about mid-March to uh, the beginning of May. When we look at 2016, it is a much narrower window from be, uh, between mid-April to beginning of May. And lastly, in 2017, for all locations, uh, relatively narrow window, but between mid-March to beginning of April. So when we overlay all three of the years together, we get this window that's about mid-March to beginning of May. So when we're talking about um, our spray applications against those crawlers, that's kind of what we want to target. And usually we're hitting around near the beginning or mid-April and again near the end of April if we're doing a second application, which is if you're doing a contact insecticide, that's probably what you want to consider. Um, 
And whereas if you're doing a drench, any type of insecticide drench, you want to hit these crawlers before they really establish and start feeding because you, you want that systemic to be in there the moment they start feeding. And so we're really doing drenches as soon as the leaves start budding out. So if you see any leaf leaf bud in the, in the landscape and you know that the trees are starting to take up in some insecticide, that would be the time to do a drench application. Now, what do you actually spray? We'll get into that uh, here in a moment. Uh, let's skip past this here. All right, so when it comes to management in the, uh, in the landscape, there's like two main kind of strategies, right? We're looking at, here we go. We are looking at either um, sp spraying uh, foliar and or bark spray applications, which you're usually doing twice, uh, like a two week interval. Again, that's related to, if you do a spray application, you're still gonna have a bunch of those crawlers, potentially in egg sacs that you wanna wait uh, and, and hit again on that second application. And in terms of our drenches, we're usually just applying once. And again, we're applying that as early as we can in the season. Uh, if there's any bit of a grade or a lot of mulch uh, around that, the base of that tree, we're usually um, forming a bit of a indentation, that ground there, right? a little bit of a trench so that we can make sure that systemic goes straight down uh, for that insecticide treatment. And I'm going to go back to my summary list here, right? So one very important disclaimer here is that um, you do not always need to control creatment of bark on the landscape. Um, I hope that, it, you know, if you're at this point where, you know, you're attending this presentation, you're learning about creatment of bark scale, it's because you've learned that criminal bark scale does not always reach very high abundances in the landscape. Uh, sometimes it can reach high populations where the next year it'll just crash on its own because, and, and not usually on its own, but usually because there are some natural predators there feeding on it. So it's not always needed to actually spray anything to control criminal bar scale. Again, the only reason I might do it is if you have a specific clientele or a specific context or situation that calls for very clean plants, right? That they cannot tolerate any scale on there at all. So um, in terms of, you know, this is over several trials now that we've done, we found that a as a trench. Uh, works great every single time. If you apply it very early in the season, when those leaves just start to bud, uh, you prevent those peaks and scales throughout the entire season. In some cases, even for two seasons. So you can get very good control um, using just a dinotefiran drench. Um, if you want to go really uh, crazy, we call this usually our nuket option, right? Okay, so this is supposed to be uh, bifenthrin. So I got bifenthrin, bifenthrin. <laughs> this is supposed to be bifenthrin, bifenthrin and dinotefuran. Use dinotefuran as a drench and bifenthrin as a bark spray. And you're doing that bark spray twice around mid April and beginning of May. And that dinotefuran really early in the season uh, also just decimates the, the scale populations. I'm going to give some disclaimers here about broad spectrums and neonicotinoids in a, in a moment. But dinotefuran um, is considered uh, a, a neonicotinoid in this class of insecticides that, again, is, is considered systemic, has taken up by the tree, but um, has more recently shown to potentially have negative impacts on pollinators, even when used as per the um, label requirements. So there are some colleagues that have found that when, when you apply with dinotefuran, um, and then a few months later, you get some blooming flowers on the crepe myrtles, which a lot of honeybees love to feed on, very popular for honeybees, um, that dinotefuran can make it in the pollen. Now, I'm, I'm waiting on the peer-reviewed publication to show the methodology and the quantity actually getting into that pollen, because that's going to be just as important, right? Like, what is the dosage that's making it in there? Is that actually considered harmful? But I do feel that it's important to provide a disclaimer with uh, dinotefran and you know, other neonicotinoid products, such as imidacloprid, that they can have uh, quite a bit of negative impact on pollinators. The same goes for bifenthrin. Bifenthrin is relatively broad spectrum. If you hit a pollinator with it, it's not going to do so hot. Uh, this also goes for a lot of the beneficial insects. So there are, as we'll see here in a moment, some beneficial predators that if you spray the spray, can have quite a bit of negative impact on their populations. But we also have pyroproxifen and buprofacine that have uh, demonstrated quite good efficacy uh, against criminal bark scale, as well as bark sprays. There's a few others that have been 
relatively decent to moderate. So flupiridiferone, for example, has been moderate. Cyanotranilaprol has been moderate. Uh, and the rest, uh, we're, we're going to see some, some data on some of these that are kind of inconclusive here in a moment. Uh, but a lot of these others that also did not work. So, yeah, if, you know, I've heard over and over again from, um, from distributors that say, you know, you should really try suffle uh, or you should really try um, some kind of mineral oil and azadiractin uh, works really well against the scale. And I've, I've used it in two, if not three separate trials and every single time did not work at all. So uh, th there are certainly things that do not work. Also, acephate will not work well at all either and actually will have a, a negative impact, same as uh, carbaryl or, or, um, or seven dust, as we'll see here in a moment. All right, going back through here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the most recent research on creatinine on a bark scale. So, that, so, so kind of feeding into that summary table, don't worry, nothing in that summary table changes as a result of our most recent research because it was basically the same insecticides that were just as effective. So we did have pilot creatinine myrtles that were highly infested that were spraying with a number of different uh, insecticides. Here's my, like I said, my Nukem option, right? I have uh, diatefrin and buprovazine in this case, that um, you're using diatefrin drench and doing two spray applications of buprovazine. Um, and then I have some other newer products that uh, have recently come to, to market, including some biologicals, some Bavaria bastiana uh, that we tested for efficacy. So I'll kind of walk you, uh, walk you through this. So when we're looking at uh, here on the x-axis, you can see week number. Okay, so this is actually the grower week number from week 14 to 33. And we uh, actually counted the number of male creatine myrtle bark scale pupae on, on branches, on at least three branches per creatine Actually, no, sorry, it was at least six branches per creatine myrtle directly on the creatine myrtle without removing it. And we did that, these different intervals. And this was replicated uh, seven times per treatment. And you can see here my untreated control, right? If I don't do anything over time, a number of male pupae drastically increases. If I use my nuket option, right? Those number of male pupae always stays down. It never increases. My imidacloprid only option also stays down the whole time, never increases. And talus, just buprovazine alone, also never increases. So again, all of those are very effective. Flupiridiferone, you can see worked quite well. Right, so you can see it increases a little bit and goes right down. So it works quite well relative to the untreated control. If I look at some of my other treatments, so still my Nucum option, very low. My Expire products, this is a relatively new product from Corteva, appear to provide some reasonable suppression. So you can see compared to the untreated control, we're talking about creatine bar scale male pupae provided good suppression. And then lastly, uh, when we're looking at these Ventigra and Orvelifer products, these are from uh, BASF, you'll see this combination of ultra pure oil and Ventigra when applied in, uh, when, when applied kind of in a rotation were quite, uh, worked quite well to provide some reasonable suppression. Uh, Ventigra alone seemed to work also reasonably well to provide suppression, but some of these uh, other combinations uh, were okay. So, so they it kind of depended, right? So even ultra pure oil mixed with Ventigra and then Velifer in a rotation appeared to ultimately provide good suppression. We can have this, this instance where it, it kind of goes up a little bit. Now we're talking about egg sacs, right? So that was only looking at uh, male pupae. We're looking at female egg sacs now. We're doing that same, those same trees and counting. Again, we see very good control with our nuket option, right? Like our nuket option is the most reliable. Amidacloprid also very good, stays very down low. Uh, just buprovazine low, also very reliable, stays low. Um, and flupiridiferone also provides very good suppression here. Now our expire products from Corteva, did not seem to have any impact on female egg sacs. So this can be kind of problematic because then in our next round, we might end up getting just as many crawlers as the untreated control. So ultimately it would seem as though Expire did not perform very well. We see a similar trend for all those Ventigra or Velifer products, those, those products from uh, BASF that we can see, for example, with Velifer uh, by week 33 appear to provide reasonable suppression of the female egg sacs appears to be the only treatment 
compared to the untreated control providing reasonable suppression of the egg sacs. But if we go back to the male pupae, provided very poor control of the pupae alone. So even uh, the mixture of the three did not provide very control, very good control of the female uh, egg sacs. And so ultimately, it's hard to say that any of these were reliable uh, to actually manage the female egg sac criminal bark scale. Now we can see a major difference aesthetically, right? So ultimately that's what, you know, we're, we're doing these treatments for. So on the left side is our untreated control where you can see very um, heavy black sooty mold and, and uh, a lot of these white spots, again, the female uh, egg sacs, female pupae, whereas on the right side, you can see the Newcomb option, which has ultimately no, uh, no sooty mold and no white spots on it. Now, you know, the question always arises is there, if you have sodium mold on there, is there anything you can do to kind of clean it up? And um, we have brushed, tried brushing, we have tried using hydrogen peroxide um, and spent a lot of labor hours. And ultimately, you can get it a bit cleaner if you put a lot of elbow grease into it. But it's hard to say whether it's really uh, worth it economically in the landscape. So unless someone's willing to do it out of a uh, labor of love, um, it kind of might not work all that well. Um, so now before we go on, what insect is this one right here, right? So we just talked about criminal bark scale. Is this one a Madeira mealybug, a citrus mealybug, pink hibiscus mealybug, or none of the above? So these are actually just uh, all mealybugs. Is this some type of a mealybug or, or none of the above? Hey there, Dr. Erfin, just a little, um, we had about 10 minutes left in the allotted time. So yeah, I'm just going for like another that. hour if that's okay. Hey man, that's uh, you can be talking <laughs> to an empty room. That'd be just fine. That's, <laughs> we appreciate yeah, you know, since you. we, since we jumped on at 1230 in my head, I, I kept thinking I had until, you know, until a 30 minute mark. <laughs> and so I'm going to move it a little bit quicker uh, from here when we're talking about all the CASPA scale. All right. So the last thing we're looking at was some of our natural enemies or beneficial insects. So that one there was actually a, a predator. It was actually a lady beetle uh, larvae. You can see here is an example of a lady beetle larvae feeding on a scale. And that's very important because when you're actually assessing how infested a tree is, for example, with scale, and you think that those are actually scale, you're doing yourself a disservice. Uh, these and these right here too is a different species of lady beetle larvae that are going to help feed on those scales. So are going to be very important uh, that if you see high populations, again, uh, an insecticide spray might not be necessary. So this is some examples of the types of lady beetles and lady beetle larvae you might find feeding on the scale insects. These are actually the exuviae of those lady beetles. So after larval stage becoming new adults, you have these exuviae that uh, stay on that branch. Uh, and so here, you know, this is a, a uh, recent graduate of Texas A&M, the same lab that uh, I studied in as well. Uh, he kind of drew some of the different uh, beneficial predators of um, the criminal bark scale and even uh, created a list. So he had done a survey of some of those predators. And again, why this is important is because there was some work done by Mike Merchant where basically he treated for just the lady beetles or treated for the scale of the combination of the two. And the treatment for the, the scale, uh, sorry, for the lady beetles, carbaryl, seven dust, to see what happens if you just kill all the beetles. And so this is what happens right here. This bar right here is what happens if you don't do any treatments at all. You end up with about 75 scale per branch. Whereas if you treat for the beetles, use seven dust, you're going to end up with about a fourfold increase in the number of scales, a drastic increase. The, the beetles are doing a really good job at helping suppress the scale populations. Now, again, if, if this number is too high, then you can get much lower numbers by spraying with an insecticide. So again, you know, not all cases in the landscape require some kind of an insecticidal spray application. Here's a little summary page, which you can go to on the PDF if you need to. Now we're going to wisp through the Cycad on Caspa scale, which was first found in 96 in Florida. Uh, and it can infest any part of, of the Cycad, which makes it particularly problematic because it can also infest the roots to a depth of about 60 centimeters. So when this is considered a quarantine pest in Texas, that becomes a major issue because any sign of that, uh, that Cycad on Caspa scale on, on the canopy might mean that it's also in the roots. Even if the stuff in the canopy is dead, you might have an active infestation in those roots. 
uh, in terms of their general life cycle, right, can vary greatly depending on uh, the outdoor temperature, but egg development can take seven to 15 days, first instar four to 18 days. So you can see here this, this wide range, which essentially means that from egg to a new egg sac can take anywhere between, you know, a couple weeks to more than a couple months. So again, if they are in that soil, it might not be, if especially in it's cooler, it, it might be a little while before you can visually see uh, new egg sats forming on the uh, upper part of the canopy. Here, you can just start to see them starting to infest those lower fronds, right? It's starting to get very high populations. Uh, and the females, you can see, are kind of oystery shaped, right? And they're white. And the males are a little bit more oblong and have kind of three um, kind of lines going down them. And eventually, you start getting dieback of the fronds, right? And at this point, um, you can get potential mortality of, of that plant. And that's why they're particularly problematic because it can actually cause mortality. And it's suggested for treatment to actually remove those fronds. You want to bag them and get rid of them. You know, bag them, double bag them, and make sure you're not uh, moving the infestation around. And by thinning that canopy, you can potentially get better penetration with some of those insecticides, right? Because insecticidal penetration is the most challenging part here when it comes to uh, that management. When it comes to prevention, it helps inspect new plant materials before we put it on the ground, especially near the base of the fronds. And again, we want to bag and trash any infested materials. Now, there are some naturally occurring populations of parasitic wasps and predatory beetles that can, well, naturally occurring, I should say, they have been released and are established. Uh, they can help suppress their populations in the landscape. So maybe in the long term, we'll kind of coexist with these scale because uh, the, these predators, these natural enemies will help keep their populations in check. But in the, in the meantime, they are really problematic. Uh, in terms of insecticides, you got to do multiple applications with good coverage of either insecticide oils uh, or insecticidal soaps uh, and or ideally a systemic. Uh, so you can actually do a drench of ditefarin to get uh, very good suppression, uh, long-term residual suppression. And then also frequent hosing with water to move old or dead scales. So the problem with a lot of scale insects is knowing whether you have an actual active infestation. So I mentioned earlier, one strategy we'd use with the criminal bark scales to actually, you know, scratch uh, with their thumbnail or a coin, the, those scale populations and see if you get this pink blood oozing. And uh, one way of just removing it in this case, they suggest is to hose off those scale. And so now it might be a good time. So like I mentioned, and you know what, this is just going to be a good resource for y'all. And I'll kind of just flip through these very quickly. So you can see kind of what I have for each of these, the T scale, uh, just a nice photo, a general description, host plants, significance, and management description. You'll notice I've even put an asterisk next to those that are, you know, nicotinoids. So you have to be very cautious about their use around pollinators or flowering plants. And I also have, if you actually download, um, the actual PDF, you can click on these. These are where, where I got most of that information related to that slide from. So if you want some more context or more in-depth information, you can uh, kind of go through that for all these different scale right here. And so if you want to access the PDF of that presentation, you can either go to sixleggedaggy.com and you'll see it's the top post right now. I just posted it right before this talk, or you can scan this QR code right now with your phone and uh, it'll take you right to the page where you can download that PDF. So at this time, I will be happy to take any questions. That was um, phenomenal. Thank you so much for being here. And I really could listen to you for another, maybe even three hours, if, if only we had the time <laughs> today. <laughs> Thank you, I real, appreciate that. Real quick before we jump to the question, there's, uh, I know we have at least one really good question in here, uh, but I did want to bring up, and let me pull this stuff out of the way here. Um, so uh, Dr. Vafai mentioned a few different products. Uh, you may have noticed in some of the slides, he had mentioned an insect growth regulator called Pyproxen. Um, so at Rainbow, we just brought this product on um, last year, the end of last year, our product's called Proxite. And it is indeed um, Pyroxifen. It's an insect growth regulator as mentioned. So it's not actually killing anything on, on contact. It disrupts your life cycle. Um, you saw that it worked really well, uh, I guess in the good phase, at least in the crepe myrtle bar scale work. And, um, you also had it listed there for, um, the cycad scale. And then of course we also have, um, our versions of dinotefuran, which can be applied as a soil application or, uh, bark spray, 
Um, and then we also have a trunk injected version of that as well. So um, this is what fits into our rainbow toolbox there. Real quick too, before we get into any other um, questions, I also wanna mention we do have our scale insect management guide. Um, and then finally, we do have some other webinars coming up. Um, and we do have a survey that we really ask you to, to fill out at the end. Once we conclude this, you'll get a link to a survey. Um, and so with that, let's take the next few moments to answer any questions we may have. Allison, um, are you there and do we yep. have something? A couple Excellent. of really good questions coming through. Um, and yes, we are at the top of the hour, but we will have a few minutes to stay. So please join us if you can. Um, we've got the label for treating with systemics lead me to believe that soil drenches or bark sprays should be applied after crepe myrtles or other trees have flowered. Thoughts on this? Yes. So uh, that would be as it relates to um, the, the uh, if I understand where that um, question is coming from, is from like the pollinator warning label. So certainly when the, the criminals are in bloom, you cannot be uh, applying those uh, systemic insecticides at that time, or at least as, as per the label says. So you have to, you know, sometimes, and I don't know, there's been a lot updated recently. So I don't know if you can still technically apply a drench while it's in bloom. Uh, but a bark spray, you'd want to be very cautious. And usually I'd be surprised if the label says that you can still do a bark spray at that time, because again, the impact on pollinators. Um, so at that time, you'd have to wait until it's you know no longer in bloom. When it comes to you know timing your application for actually getting the scale, um, if you were to apply it after bloom, which is usually pretty late in the season, um, you know, you're gonna be you're going to miss uh, a huge window of actually hitting a lot of those, um, those scale crawlers before they become you know, pupae or female egg sacs. So you're going to get a lot of white spots. You're going to get a lot of sooty mold in an entire season as a result. Now, a later application may help subsequently greatly reduce their populations the next year. Uh, but that's not, you know, that's not work we've done to, to determine that because again, it just seems very suboptimal from a, if you're treating for a aesthetics standpoint. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I, I hope that kind of covers that question. Yeah. And I think that question, sorry to jump in, but that question was pretty generalized. So I, I would add, it depends on what product you're using and you need to be mindful of uptake time, depending on, on that. Um, yeah. but thank you. That was a great answer. And then last question before we pop off is cold weather that we had, um, going to be enough to knock back populations of our scales. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, uh, I'd be very curious. On the one hand, I, I hope not because I have 100 crepe myrtles that were highly infested with scale that I was hoping to do a trial with. But uh, for all of everyone else's sake, I guess maybe that would be nice if it knocked them back. Um, you know, insects have a lot of different strategies when it comes to dealing with cold. Um, some of them have, you know, uh, freeze tolerance. So some insects can actually tolerate being frozen solid and thawing out and still being alive. Some have uh, some freeze avoidance strategy where they can produce some antifreezes in their body that actually reduces the temperature at which uh, ice forms in their bodies. So they can stay alive again, at very low temperatures. With criminal bark scale, uh, I, I, I don't know uh, if we actually know um, what their, their, cold, um, their cold tolerance strategy is, their overwintering strategy is. And the same goes for perhaps a lot of these scale. Um, you know, I wouldn't know the full details of, of how they survive it, but we do know this, that again, you know, within these little microclimates, so within the, the bark of these trees, uh, perhaps under the snow or perhaps even under ice. It's a lot more insulated than the ambient temperature. So I would expect the, the temperature is quite a bit warmer uh, where those scale are actually present as compared to the ambient temperature. Only time will tell, you know, if they survived, you know, what kind of population survived, um, which species survived. And also the next question would be, you know, did their predators and or parasitic wasps survive? So even if it knocked down the scale a good amount, if it knocked down the predators a lot more, uh, then we could just be in just as much trouble as before, right? In terms of pest populations. So it's really hard to predict because there's so many different interacting factors there. Great. That's great. That's all I've got. I was going to say that's all of our questions. Um, thank you again so much. That was, um, I thought that was great. Um, excellent presentation. Everybody that joined us today, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Um, 
again, stay tuned for more information. Um, and thanks again, everyone. We will conclude it here. Please take that survey. Um, and then, you know, if within that survey, please be as, uh, as honest as, uh, as you allow yourself. It only helps us to improve on, on what we do and what we offer. So again, thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. And we look forward to seeing y'all here again soon. Thank y'all. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.